Quantum computing used to sound like science fiction, but increasingly it's starting to become reality. We're here at the headquarters of Intel Labs to find out more about how the company is making these chips possible. If you imagine a coin like this, it's, it's heads or it's tails, it's one or the other. So it represents one state or another. Now, imagine if I had a coin that was spinning. Let's see if I can do this. And I ask you, is it heads or is it tails? Now I know it's heads. Now you know it's heads. <laughs> but if, but while it was know. spinning, yeah. but while it was spinning, um, you don't know. It's, it's neither or it's both. And so that's the power of quantum computing. Unlike a classical computer, which processes binary code that translates to on and off states, quantum computing's qubit functions in a world of probability. Now imagine if I had two spinning coins, and I said, uh, how many uh, states are there? This exponential growth in probability leads to mind-boggling processing power. If I had 50 qubits, or 50 spinning coins, um, I could represent more states than there are uh, available in any supercomputer on Earth. If I had 300 of these spinning coins, um, or 300 qubits, and, and they were all coupled um, I could represent more states than there are atoms in the galaxy. Qubits are um, very fragile, and in reality you're going to have to use more of them than you expected in order to get a usable system. It's probably going to take millions of qubits to get the job done. Researchers can manage only tens of qubits right now. Even so, quantum computers require chip sizes and system sizes well beyond what we're used to seeing. We've taken um, a, a, qubit, uh, a qubit chip, this is for our superconducting qubit platform, uh, and we've put it on a package. What you see here is a package that's been optimized for low temperature mechanical strength, optimized for very good RF or radio uh, performance, actually microwave performance. We've also optimized it for basically signal integrity. And so these represent uh, gold uh, RF connectors, think coax connectors, uh, that, that are particularly well suited for low noise. We operate these systems at very cold temperatures. Uh, we have these refrigerators called dilution refrigerators. They're about the size of a 55 gallon drum. Uh, and they can get down to a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. And in fact, um, we would say that they're 250 times colder than deep space. If we think about the first Cray supercomputers in the mid-70s, these were very large, um, probably as large as you know, half this room. And these were the most powerful computers on Earth at the time. And no one would have thought that close to 40 years later we would have miniaturized these uh, and, and more into our back pockets. So uh, probably what I'll do is I'll leave that miniaturization for the next generation. <laughs> but right now I actually don't think it's a problem to have a, a large system. Um, if that system is, I'll say, the world's most powerful computer. Uh, I think people would, will not mind the, the space if it's reasonable, if, if that's the case. Building quantum chips at volume is another problem to solve. Intel, though, is uniquely capable of tackling that issue head on and the company thinks traditional silicon is the path forward. A silicon spin qubit looks a lot like a transistor, like the transistor you'd find in our latest technology node. But we operate it with only one electron, okay? And so we have single electron transistors, we put the whole thing in the fridge in a magnetic field, and we can actually monitor the state of that single transistor. It's either spin up or spin down. That represents the two states of the, uh, of the qubit. We're using similar equipment, so this is running in the same fab that's, that's doing the, 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 the cutting edge uh, core chips. Uh, our design rules are a little bit different. We're tailoring them to specific structures, but largely the materials are, are the same. I think roughly 50,000 qubits on this wafer. They're not coupled together, so we can't use them together, uh, but you see the power of using Intel's advanced process lines to make qubits. If we can get this technology working, we're going to be making chips that are exactly the same from uh, wafer to wafer, and we're going to have lots and lots uh, of qubit arrays on any given wafer. The tech isn't ready yet, and it may take years, but Intel thinks its experience is a definite advantage. We are betting that Intel's expertise with the Intel architecture, uh, that sort of uh, expertise at the person level, 
uh, that we can bring those people to Quantum uh, and make headway. If the company can crack it, we'll be one step closer to seeing quantum chips outside of research labs and into the computers you might actually use. Just be patient. It may take a decade or three.